Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. I know your heart will always be mine. I know your heart will always be mine. It's a song called Your Heart Will Always Be My Home. That is by a chap called Keith Potka, who is uh, oh, a, a young up-and-coming musician that we know a little bit about. Of course, it is the same Keith Potka who was a member of the Seekers, but uh, we are extremely pleased to welcome him to the microphone versus uh, via the telephone. Keith Potka, good morning. Good morning, guys, and uh, good morning to your listeners. The Grouse Song. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's, that's good. It's one of my one of the songs that I do in my solo shows these days, and uh, it seems to get uh, a good reaction. It, it's funny, Keith, because obviously you know we talk about the the music that you've been most associated with over the last what is it sixty years or so. But I, I listened to that song for the first time during the week. You kindly sent that through to us so that we could play it, and we've got another one called "Peace in My Time" coming up after we've chatted to you. Right. Um, the thing that struck me most about that song was it sounded like I'd known it for years, and yet oh. I'd heard it for the first time. How- well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's really a really interesting comment, actually, and uh, uh, perhaps that's uh, the secret of a, of a song that has some staying power. I, don't, I wouldn't know, but um, anyway, it's all in the ear of the beholder. Isn't it, though? I got a t- I, you know how when you drink a red wine, they go, I get a touch of berries. And I, I had a touch, <laughs> yeah. of, a touch of Van Morrison in the background there of that one. <laughs> Van Morrison. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that, that that really is interesting. Again, as I say, it's in the ear of the beholder because some, you know, some people think uh, a bit of Gordon Lightfoot or a bit of this or a bit of that, but it's all it's a hundred percent me, and that's that's the other way of looking at it. We uh, might touch base about Gordon Lightfoot in a moment because I know a little bit about your what you're doing there. But Rob's got a question. Yeah. Gordon Lightfoot. I loved his work. My brother bought an album of his in uh, probably late sixties, early seventies. I don't know the timing, but it was on my playing uh, list when my brother wasn't allowed because I was around because I wasn't allowed to play his record. Um, <laughs> Uh, Keith, let's stay forward before we go back, and we do need to go back to the Seekers, but you work, um, it's it's just phenomenal to, for Neil and I were just saying off air, we've got to realise you're 81 years of age, it's it's staggering to think that you still produce that quality, you still have a passion to perform, you're still prepared to go on the road to do that, What what continues to drive you? Well, I love the music, that's for sure, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly healthy, so I'm taking advantage of all of that, really, and uh, uh, making sure that, uh, that I can present uh, any of my music to anyone who will listen, and that's, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm still doing it now. It's great. What about the energy to create the new stuff, though? Um, that, that obviously um, takes a little bit more time and effort to sit in the studio. It's, it, it's all very well to get yourself up for a live performance and then go home and have a spell, but... You're obviously still creating new music. That, to me, is the biggest uh, surprise. I can understand the desire to perform, but what drives you to keep creating? Well, uh, it, it's, it just seems to flow. I, I'm, I'm uh, not quite sure where the, the wellspring is, but it's somewhere down there, and uh, it just seems to flow out. And, and I've just written a, a new song uh, that I've been promoting on my solo shows. I've just done uh, eight shows in Tasmania, actually, and, and I was able to to sort of road test this song uh, while I was down there. It's called Where Have the Years Gone? And you can probably guess from the, the title what the, what the, uh, the content of the song is. But it's, it's just that, that's, that was inspired, or should I say influenced, by recent happenings. And, uh, uh, and the Australian story that, um, that, that happened on uh, the, the ABC broadcast last Monday is, uh, is an example of that. You look at that show and think, wow, all, all those years have gone by, and, and um, look what's happened in between. Um, it was funny watching it for me. I got really emotionally attached. I was just saying to you, to you off air that uh, it brought back a lot of memories and things that I had either not realised or had forgotten about you as an individual and, and you as a group and, and the hold you had on, on the Australian music scene, but also the, the Australian people. Do, do you still pinch yourself a bit to, to think that... Um, at that time, so many Australians just looked up to you with this total adulation. Oh yeah, very, very much so. It's just one of those uh, one of those things that uh, that brings with it 
uh, some great humility as well because uh, just to to get that um, feedback from the audience uh, over so many decades in fact is just uh, awesome to us because uh, and we all agree you know we all have the same attitude to towards uh, our fans and 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 the fact that they have been so so loyal and and caring and and with us all the way the uh, the other thing that came out was um the thing that I didn't realize was the when the band ended, um, my mind wasn't aware of the fact that there was a little bit of dysfunction in the group uh, and, and it sort of came out strongly on Monday night that Bruce and, and Judith, un, sort of unbeknownst to Judith, but Bruce had uh, some some emotional disconnect. Uh, was, was that a, a tough time for you that you looked so together all the time in our eyes? Was it, was it always a bit rumbly behind the scenes? No, uh, my, my particular... Um circumstance at that stage was that I was uh, I was married and um, and I already had uh, a son and so my uh, and I was living in, in England or I had uh, decided to stay on in England so I had a I had a different path but uh, but Bruce to be fair his mother had died just a few months beforehand and uh, that was a huge uh, shock to him and also uh, to to us because um, uh, our, our parents were actually quite a team behind the scenes as well and that was that was an interesting um, level of uh, connection that the group had uh, but we all had our, our individual uh, our individual reactions to the to the group disbanding and um, I, I suppose I may have been the the, the most settled in the, in that sense when uh, when that happened because the other thing that a lot of people don't realize um, we you you then formed the New Seekers in the UK. Um, that, that that must have sort of, it, it, I guess, kept you busy, but also gave you a whole new outlook on you know life after the group. Very much so. Yes, it was in uh, uh, August of 1969 that my business partner David Joseph and I uh, put the New Seekers on the road, and, and it was one of those um, exercises in forming a group from uh, from people that we auditioned, and uh, it. Uh, Luckily for us, and with the help, the great help of David Mackay, who produced some fantastic songs for them, uh, they and we had some uh, some great hits. So uh, they carried the name forward, along with a very large soft drink manufacturer in the United States, who had a bit to do with it. I suspect. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, the the sound of the voice it was uh, a sound of the group, I should say, was unique. Judith Durham, you know, on in her own right, just the most beautiful beautiful voice but the the harmonic connection and it was explained on monday night about the different levels of your voice and it, to us it it's not something we pick up but for you who are, are deeply involved in the music industry just the subtle differences between your voice bruce's voice athol's voice what you bring to support judith yeah. was it really just an accidental perfect storm uh it ended up that way yes because uh, <clears throat> as it turned out um i uh, I'm a, a tenor voice, and Bruce is a baritone, and and um, and Athol is a bass baritone. So, uh, for for Judith to uh, be singing on top of that combination of voices was really perfect. And from the point of view of when when uh, there was a male lead song, which invariably Bruce took the lead on, it meant that um, I was able to arrange uh, for uh, Judith and my vocal parts to to be above Bruce's, and that that created another. A harmony level as well so uh, it, it, it worked out really really well and for those uh, uninitiated like us we imagine in a studio there's an enormous amount of work done on musical instruments and where to fit them in but are you suggesting that you literally did play another um, sound game with the with the voices as well as the musical instruments to hit perfection oh well yes yeah, so the, in the in the arrangements of course uh, you, you have to uh, you have to follow the follow the melody, but um, but as uh, as I was saying, that the combination or you were referring to the the combination of the of the voices really um, gave the uh, gave the harmonies that uh, that little extra edge, I suppose. And uh, we mustn't forget the the recording engineers who who brought their great talent to the uh, to, to the studio sessions as well. And and Tom Springfield's wonderful production. Uh, I mean, he he really uh, pretty much became the fifth seeker and uh, produced all those early singles and albums for us. One of the other things that's probably unknown about you, Keith, as a 
as an individual outside of the Seekers was that you were born in Sri Lanka, or in those days, I suspect, Ceylon. Uh, yes, it was called Ceylon. Uh, and yes, I, I and my family came out to uh, Australia uh, in 19, early 1948. And we lived in St Kilda first off, and then uh, we moved around a lot. And I went to school locally in, at St Kilda Park State School, and, and then on to Melbourne High. And Melbourne High was was where I uh, started my group singing activities. In fact, when I was in fifth form. Um, before I get on to Judith, just want to touch on. Uh, I'm, we're talking about from where we sit, having the the sort of fanboy adulation. But as a youngster. Did you have somebody in the musical industry that that you just loved, admired, wanted to be like? Well, the the, the big uh, harmony groups at that stage were what I was really uh, uh, influenced by, I suppose, like the Four Freshmen and the, and the High Lows and, and people like that. And so those those arrangements that they did, they were the they were the things that really intrigued me. And of course, in, before that, before those groups or alongside those groups, there were people like the Diamonds and. And I, I had a uh, one of the groups that Ethel and I had was called the Escorts, and and we did all those bebop things, uh, songs by the Crew Cuts and stuff like that. There wasn't much um, original songwriting around at that stage. It was all pretty much um, singing the the Great American Songbook or uh, or some of the rock and roll classics like Crazy About Your Baby and um, and Little Darling from the Diamonds and that sort of thing. Now, let's talk Judith Durham. We've sadly lost her, and, and, and it's been quite astonishing the way it's affected people, you know, even friends of mine, that um, were really, really shocked. We've had a bad year for loss of Australian musical icons, and, and, and it really did rock the boat. I, watching Monday night, and uh, you um, spoke and uh, interviewed after the loss, it, it looked to me that you were, like many of us, um, just completely deeply saddened by the whole thing you it, it seemed you were very close to her very close indeed yes and and it was uh i i suppose uh, a lot of people say this really uh, about their uh their people who have uh, died that, that it's not unexpected but when it does happen uh, it creates a huge chasm and that's exactly what happened for uh, for me and i'm sure it did for Ethel and bruce as well and, and and of course her family judith's family her sister beverly and her uh, nieces and nephews, and uh, it was uh, it was a huge loss. But uh, uh, but as I say, it it was not unexpected because Judith had been uh, frail for uh, for a little while preceding. And when when we heard about her again in the, the Australian story activity the other night, the uh, lung condition that she had, most people wouldn't have known she had that because the thing that you know the one thing you need to be able to do what she used to do was have really good lungs, and yet to be able to overcome that and still provide an extraordinary voice was just extraordinary. Oh, well, absolutely. And she looked after herself extreme, extremely well uh, because uh, she knew that she had to overcome uh, those uh, those handicaps. And, and, and really, it was uh, for, for practically all her life, actually. And that, that was one of the things that, that really most people did not know about. And we were... We were close to it, but we, uh, uh, in being close to it, we realised what a what an incredibly heroic uh, person she she was, and in the way that she dealt with that uh, issue and overcame it. Uh, Keith, going back to the way you arranged the the music, were there times where um, the arrangement needed to take in to the fact that maybe Judith couldn't? because of her lung condition, perhaps he couldn't do things you'd really wanted to do and you had to pull her work back and change the sound to suit um, possible shortcomings that she had? No, never. I can, I can honestly say it never, never influenced. No, she always rose to the occasion. She was magnificent in that respect uh, because uh, uh, even, even uh, in our most recent concerts after she had had a brain aneurysm and all that sort of thing, we were still, still singing songs in um, in the original key that we recorded them in decades before. So it just shows how resilient she uh, actually was. Yeah, to me, it was almost like finding out that an athlete has got asthma, or yeah, you know, it just it, quite extraordinary that she was able to do what she did. Yeah, very much so. So um, the primary reason that we brought you along today was to talk about your live performances and so forth. And we, we know that in the early 1970s, you were doing the new Seekers and every now and again, the I, I hate to use the expression old Seekers, but you know what I mean, uh, would pop up for uh, a tour or whatever. 
what was your musical journey along in the background that leads you to now being able to go out and do a whole lot of um, solo shows? Well, I suppose I, it was because I started writing songs, and that was while the group uh, had reformed in um, 93, 1993. And uh, I was lucky enough to have some of my songs recorded, and uh, one of them was uh, the, the song that I, one of the songs I sent you, Guardian Angel, Guarding Light, which I ended up um, uh, having as my solo spot in the Seekers concerts in 2013 and 2014. So it was it was pretty much an extension of that really that that I decided to to go on and and do some solo shows and uh, and be um, be an entertainer rather than just a, a singer and a guitarist. I, I want to entertain people. I want to make people smile. And I think that's what I've been able to do over the last little while. Because it, it's one thing uh, you know to go out and be. I think it's fair to say, you know, one of the the less high profile folk in a group of four. I mean, clearly, you were there smiling and playing guitar and, and a great contribution. But you know, if you ask people to name the Seekers, you probably weren't the first one they named. Um, to then go out and do it all by yourself, that must be a bit of a, a mindset change. Uh, it is in in one way, but I, I'm I'm just sort of doing it without three others, uh, really, in that respect. But um, a bit, I suppose, it comes down to whether uh, whether I can cut the mustard, you know, whether mm. if, if I'm if I'm going to be out there, whether uh, people who do come along uh, on the basis of whatever they feel that my contribution was to the seekers, uh, whether when they come along that they that they leave uh, satisfied and uh, and um, and are happy to contemplate coming back again <laughs> and visiting, you know. Uh, Keith, you've, it's quite obvious in your discussion today that you had a love for music at a very early age and it was about harmony and, and pitch and getting everything right in the arranging of things. Have have you been involved in what you look back now as the perfect song? Oh gosh, uh, the perfect song. Uh, well, I, I reckon um, I'll Never Find Another You was, was probably pretty close to one of those with, uh, with, with uh, Tom Springfield presenting that to us as the first song that opened the door to so many more uh, but a lot, other people have uh, thought that Georgie Girl is the, is the perfect pop song in its construction and things like that but as far as as far as harmonies go and things like that I, I think um, I'll never find another use pretty damn good yeah, the carnival is over is pretty damn good too, but it was uh, it was the one that made me cry the other night to see oh, yeah. Judas singing that, you know, in the context of the way the show was put together. And, and when you yeah. see us singing it with such incredible passion and you as a group, you know, yeah. singing it in a way that it, that it genuinely was, um, th that, that was sort of always the one. It was my favourite one to sing along with, I must admit. Yeah. Well, it is actually my favourite song as well, but, but from the point of view of harmonies and things like that, it's more, it's more Judith's vehicle, that one. And... Um, uh, so that you know the harmonies are a little, little less, uh, little less obvious on that. Uh, but uh, but it, it is my favourite song of, of the uh, of the group. That's that's for sure. You want to hear the Russians sing the original version of it? It's not such an uplifting <laughs> song, I can tell you, because <laughs> of course it was originally based on a, a Russian f uh, folk song. And that's right. A totally different message in that folk song. <laughs> you wouldn't want to know about. That. No, I wouldn't have thought so. Um, and, uh, of course, we spoke to Russell Morris last year as a songwriter. His a response to, has he been uh, ever seen the perfect song? He said, no, I'm writing it next week. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> That's a very, very good answer. <laughs> yes, indeed. So when people come along to, to see you, uh, and you, we should tell the people that at, you're at the door, uh, the door Gallery Cafe in uh, Finesford, just uh, over the river from the Finesford Hotel. Everything, all of our listeners need to have a, a reference point to a hotel, you understand, Keith. Um, they, that's uh, Friday next week, Friday the 4th, this coming Friday, in fact. Yeah, and, um, and tickets are available through trybooking.com. Yep. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm returning there. Actually, I, I was there earlier this year in February, and... Uh, and so, luckily, they've they've asked me back, which is great. But uh, yeah, tickets. Uh, it includes dinner, incidentally, and it's seventy bucks a head. And trybooking dot com is the uh, uh, is the booking agency. So, um, what can people expect apart from a feed? By the sound of it, what what sort of uh, music are they going to hear? They, they presumably they'll hear one or two seeker songs along the way, but predominantly your stuff. Oh yeah, well, I pay great respect to the seeker songs, and I do more than one. Uh, <laughs> I do several several seeker songs. Uh, but I, yes, I do like to present my original material as well, but, but other songs that people 
that people know and a bit of country music and uh, and I love to tell some stories about my time in the music industry and uh, bring bring people uh, into the fold if you like and uh, give them some some background to what the what the group was going through at that time uh, and uh, yeah generally generally it's it's a pretty upbeat show really and and as I say I love to leave people um, smiling <laughs> and with a with a feel good exit shall we say so you look out into the crowd are you seeing a whole lot of people of I was going to say Rob's age, but you know he's, he's uh, so much older than me. Or you, you, you know, you're seeing people bringing their grandkids. Uh, you're seeing young folk coming. What's the audience demographic typically like? Yeah, there's, there's a quite a uh, quite an array of ages. Actually, you, you've hit the nail on the head there, Neil, because uh, uh, people do come from all ages, and there are, there are young people who grow up in um, in seekers type households, and they've listened to the music, and they. They find something attractive in it, and uh, uh, and they they just love it. In fact, just the other day, uh, I, I had a, a wonderful message from a young man in in America, uh, Jacob, his name is, and uh, he has his walls. He's only about uh, 21 years of age, and uh, doing mechanical engineering and learning piano, and he has his walls plastered with seekers posters, <laughs> and he has records and things. So uh, they 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 come in all sizes and ages. It's a very strong link between mathematics and uh, engineering and being a, a good musician, I'm told. If you're good at mathematics, yeah. you should be good at music. Well, that, that, could be, that could be a good connection, yes. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, I was really good at mathematics. Uh, I, was, I was hopeless at mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> so between us... <laughs> um, yeah, between us, we can make a deal with us. Yeah. Lovely segue with connections. Did your Tom Sp- Springfield connection ever get you to meet Dusty? Oh yeah, well that was that was one of the reasons that, that, that we met Tom actually. It was because uh, our booking agency in England uh, got us a gig in Blackpool, and uh, we did a Sunday concert there. And the headliner was Dusty Springfield, so we were on the same stage with her, and uh, and we chatted, and, and then we became quite good friends really. And, and uh, through her and through other uh, avenues, we um, we met Tom Springfield, and as I say, he became uh, virtually a part of the group. And and the same as your music has lived through the ages. Um, were you were you just in awe of her talent because she stacks up very well against historical female voices. Oh, totally. I mean, she she's absolutely outstanding. And one of those voices you just have to hear it on the radio or whatever. You know exactly who that person is. And mm. She's startlingly uh, identifiable and, and really good. And, and incidentally, she she has she was so shy and and un- self-confident about her talent you know she would um, she would be um, cringing about her performances and everyone else is saying what, what what's wrong <laughs> These are sensational takes and she would ask for another take or something like that and the first take was always the best you know it's one of those situations I was told the other day by someone very because when you do a radio program, people know they come up and give you all sorts of information about the music industry and so forth. And I was yeah. given a very firm statement the other day that Tom Springfield couldn't possibly be Dusty Springfield's brother because that wasn't her real name. No, that's right. <laughs> that wasn't her real name, <laughs> isn't that weird? They were in fact the O'Briens, but, <laughs> but they were brother and sister yeah. the O'Briens. Yeah, you hear Dusty O'Brien, you sort of think banjo, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, it's a different, uh, different uh, connection altogether, different image. Yes. Like Nino Tempo and April Stevens, who were the original artists on a song called Deep Purple. They were brother and sister, and apparently one of them hated their surname, so they changed it to something different. <laughs> it, it does happen. Keith Podgrid, it's always a great thrill to hear from you and to have a chat, and thank you so much for reaching out and letting us know you're coming to Geelong. Sadly, I'm in the state, otherwise you would see me sitting in the front row. Um <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, next time check my diary before you go organising concerts. That'd be great. I will. I'll, I'll give you some notice. <laughs> if people aren't able to get to the Door Cafe on Friday night, the 4th of November, where else can they see you reasonably locally? Ah, reasonably locally, not for a while, Neil, because um, my other gigs uh, for the uh, uh, near future are up in New South Wales and heading up the... New South Wales, uh, uh, Central Coast and places like that. So, no, I won't be down in, in your neck of the woods for a little while, but uh, it just depends on on, um, uh, on what happens in this in this wonderful coming year, which which probably brings great promise for a lot of people. Where can people look at, um, because we've obviously got listeners all over Australia, Keith, both of them. Um, so, if is there a spot they can go and find uh, dates? 
Well, yeah, uh, KatePodka.com is my is my website, mm-hmm. and so if they care to look at that, uh, otherwise, um, I generally uh, post on Facebook and uh, try and keep up my uh, yeah, I try and keep up my website. I suppose that that's the thing, uh, or um, or else they can yeah, Facebook and Facebook and the website are probably the best uh, best places to look. Yeah. Excellent, I'm Keith. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Been a joy to chat. Thank you for your again your openness and honesty. It's uh, it's fascinating. Uh, I know. Uh, I know. There's many people who are still quite infatuated with what the seekers have done in their world, and uh, it's great to see you continuing. Oh, thanks, Neil. It's really, it's really lovely to talk to you too after such a long time. And uh, I wish you well, both of you, and um, and we'll talk in uh, some time. Best so. wishes. In fact, you could say the Seekers, they were in a world of their own. They Couldn't were you? indeed. <laughs> we're going to hear another Keith Potka song now. It's called Peace in My Time. Thanks for joining us, Keith. Okay, thank you. All, All the best. Now. Bye.